Earlier this week, the House Oversight Subcommittee on National Security held a hearing on detecting fraud and waste in Afghanistan and Pakistan. We'll show it to you now for the next two hours. Good morning, everyone. It's a quorum being present of the Subcommittee on National Security and Foreign Affairs, the hearing entitled Afghanistan and Pakistan Accountability Community Oversight of a New Interagency Strategy will come to order. Before we begin the hearing, I'd just like to quickly address one piece of business that is left over from the Subcommittee's June 6, 2009 hearing that was entitled U.S. Contributions to the Response to Pakistan's Humanitarian Crisis, the Situation and the Stakes. After that hearing, I had received a request from the United States Agency for International Development to submit a statement for the record. I'd like, I would note that the USAID received an invitation to submit a statement prior to the hearing but declined to do so. However, given the relevance of this statement to the subject matter of the hearing, I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be reopened, USAID's statement be submitted for the record, and that the hearing uh, record then be closed, reclosed. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that only the chairman and ranking member of the subcommittee be allowed to make opening statements and without objection so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the hearing record be kept open for five business days so that all members of the subcommittee be allowed to submit a written statement for the record without objection so ordered. So uh, once again, good morning to everybody here. I've already explained to the people on our panel that I, I'm sure there's no sign of disrespect for, uh, from members uh, to the people that are kind enough to come in and testify. Uh, and that those members that don't get here to the hearing will certainly read the testimony for the record and the transcript afterwards. Uh, but I know that at least on the Democratic side, there's a caucus going on, as I indicated, probably uh, some discussion about health care, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and so we just want to uh, express that. Uh, and otherwise, uh, the, uh, the hearing today probably couldn't be more timely than it is, because in the coming days, the Commanding General in Afghanistan, Lieutenant General Stanley McChrystal, is expected to request that President Obama provide significant additional numbers of troops for our effort there. Meanwhile, in the coming weeks, Congress will consider final passage of a bill to triple U.S. aid to Pakistan to almost $1.5 billion a year. In short, the United States is on the verge of doubling down on a commitment of troops and treasure to Afghanistan and Pakistan. As we've learned in Iraq, however, a sudden increase in conflict resources exponentially increases the likelihood of waste, fraud, and abuse. Unfortunately, some of our programs in Afghanistan and Pakistan to date have been flawed and have lacked basic accountability measures. For example, last year, the subcommittee and the General uh, Government Accountability Office conducted major investigations of the Coalition Support Funds program uh, by which the United States reimburses Pakistan for expenses it, it, it incurs in certain counterterrorism operations. This program has represented the bulk of United States aid to Pakistan in the past seven years, some $6.7 billion to date. The investigations found that there were no receipts for a significant portion of the U.S. reimbursements to Pakistan and that the program lacked basic accountability provisions. Further, the reimbursement program isn't really designed to improve the Pakistani military's capabilities for counterterrorism and counterinsurgency operations. In Afghanistan in January of 2009, the Government Accountability Office report brought attention to the significant lack of accountability for 242,203 small arms provided to the Afghan National Security Forces. The Department of Defense's Combined Security Transition Command in Afghanistan, otherwise known as C-Sticker, uh, could not provide records, did not track serial numbers, or could not locate a significant portion of the weapons provided. In addition, the report drew to the attention to the inability of the Afghan National Security Forces to safeguard those weapons. While we are at a crossroads in United States policy here in Washington, D.C., it appears that we're also at a crossroads on the ground in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Trends in Afghanistan have not been good. The Taliban is resurgent from Kandahar to Kunduz. Three weeks ago, Afghanistan held presidential and provincial elections in the middle of this deteriorating security situation. The results of that election are not final, but there are credible reports of widespread fraud. Any cloud over the legitimacy of Afghanistan's president would, not, would add a sense of insecurity that threatens international efforts there. In Pakistan, the story is more mixed. After years of inconsistent attention to the threat posed by extremist militants, Pakistan's civilian leadership and military forces seem to have gathered the resolve necessary to confront the challenges they face. They harnessed the political will and manpower to retake the Swat Valley 
and the adjoining areas of the Malakhand region. Many Pakistani soldiers paid the ultimate sacrifice during this campaign. Unfortunately, it stalled at the border of South Waziristan, by all accounts a hotbed of militancy, including senior al-Qaeda leadership. The killing last month of Ayatollah Massoud was a significant development, but it must be followed by concerted efforts by the Pakistanis themselves to bring security and to reassert the authority and services of its government in these troubled regions. In Afghanistan, the United States and international reconstruction and aid efforts face a daunting challenge trying to rebuild a war-torn country in the midst of active insurgency. In Pakistan, security challenges and political sensitivities currently restrict inspectors general from the mobility, access, and presence necessary to do the task. The principal question guiding today's hearing is whether the accountability community is prepared to ramp up its own efforts to mirror the massive increase in resources that the United States will devote to Pakistan and Afghanistan in the coming years. Frankly, I have serious concerns about the community's collective ability to provide comprehensive oversight coverage that keeps pace with the rapid bloom in United States activities in the region, especially given the enormous burdens already borne by those offices. The threshold challenge they face is security. After numerous trips to Afghanistan and Pakistan, I'm acutely aware of the strict limits imposed on personnel in country. However, a sustained physical presence in Afghanistan and Pakistan is crucial to establishing the relationships necessary to receive tips of waste, fraud, and abuse. Three-week rotations are not enough to establish the informal interactions that can provide vital information about flawed and fatal activities. Another concern I have is the accountability community's coverage of United States aid to Pakistan. Security challenges make U.S. aid efforts all the more vulnerable to waste, fraud, and abuse. In particular, I have serious questions regarding oversight coverage of aid efforts in the Northwest Frontier Province and the federally administered tribal areas. Finally, I'd like all the panelists' thoughts on Ambassador Eikenberry's call to Afghanize more of our aid efforts in order to build Afghan government capacity. How will the United States government accountability community navigate its role in overseeing such aid programs? We count on the Inspectors General and the GAO as bulwarks against waste, fraud, and abuse. Especially in these difficult economic times, we must demand absolute transparency and accountability for every last taxpayer dollar. Thank you. With that, I'll ask Mr. Flake for his opening remarks. I thank the chairman. I want to mention also uh, Republicans are caucusing as well. I apologize. Uh, both of us had to slip away. Um, but I have the same concerns as the chairman uh, with regard to the oversight community's ability to police and, and to make sure that, uh, that there isn't significant waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, I think with the backdrop here of uh, a commitment to, to step up uh, our troop levels there, uh, with uh, what uh, Michael Mullen and, and others have described as a serious and deteriorating situation in Afghanistan. It uh, makes uh, this kind of hearing very important to see what safeguards are in place and if you have the resources and the tools uh, to ensure that our money is being well spent. So with that, uh, I look forward to hearing the witnesses. Thank you. Uh, the subcommittee will now receive testimony from the panel before us today. I'll give a brief introduction of each of the panelists uh, and thankfully it is brief because we really read all of your credentials out. It would probably take up the rest of the hearing. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel here today that has been doing great service to the, to the country, which we appreciate, and we understand also the difficulty of what you were asked to do. Uh, to my far left is the Major General Arnold Fields, who serves as the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, affectionately known as SIGAR. Uh, from 2007 to 2008, he served as the Deputy Director of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies in the Department of Defense. He retired from the United States Marine Corps in 2004 and previously served as the Deputy Commander of the Marine Corps Forces in Europe. General Fields holds a BS from South Carolina State University and an MA from Pepperdine University. Mr. Gordon Hedell uh, serves as the Inspector General for the Department of Defense. From 2001 to 2009, he served as the Inspector General at the Department of Labor. Prior to this position, he served in the United States Secret Service for 29 years where he worked as the Assistant Director leading the Secret Service's inspection and internal affairs uh, programs worldwide. Uh, Mr. Hedell uh, holds a BA from the University of Missouri and an MA from the University of Illinois. Mr. Donald Gambatista uh, serves as the Inspector General of the United States Agency for International Development and concurrently holds this position at the Millennium Challenge Corporation and the United States African Development Foundation and the Inter-American Foundation. Prior to this post, Mr. Gambatisa served as the Deputy uh, Director of the United States Marshal Service, 
He previously spent 24 years as a special agent in the United States Secret Service, and he holds a BA from John Carroll University. Ambassador uh, Harold Geisel serves as the Acting Inspector General for the Department of State. From 2002 to 2003, he served as the head of delegation for negotiations with the People's Republic of China on the construction of new embassies. Prior to assuming this post, he served for more than 25 years in the United States Foreign Service. He holds a BA from John Hopkins University and an MS from the University of Virginia. And Ms. Jacqueline Williams Bridges serves as the Managing Director of International Affairs and Trade in the United States Government Accountability Office. From 2002 to 2004, she led the Strategic Planning and External Liaison Unit in the Government Accountability Office. Prior to this position, she served as the Inspector General of the United States Department of State and the United States Arms Control and Disarmament Agency and the United States Information Agency and the Broadcasting Board of Governors. I want to thank you all again for being witnesses here today, for making yourselves available with your substantial expertise. As you all know, it's the policy of this committee to square witnesses in before they testify. So I ask you to please stand and raise your right hands. If there's anybody else that will be testifying with you, uh, that I ask that they also do the same. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay. Thank you. Uh, the record will indicate that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, I do tell you that all of your written statements uh, will be put on the record. I know some of you were kind enough to file extensive written statements, so you needn't feel compelled uh, to, to lend just to that. You, uh, we're happy to have comments for five minutes uh, if we can, and then we'll go to questions and answers on that. So why don't we start with uh, you, General. Thank you again for being here. Good morning. Chairman Tierney, uh, Ranking Member Flake, and other members of this subcommittee. Thank you very much for inviting me to participate um, at this hearing. In keeping with our mandate, which focuses on Afghanistan, uh, my opening remarks this morning uh, will uh, be provided accordingly. Uh, I've provided a written statement, and um, I wish to, at this time, highlight a few of the elements of that statement. As the newest organization at this table, it was less than a year ago that CIGAR obtained funding. We continue to aggressively build our organization <clears throat> to conduct reviews of our reconstruction projects and to provide findings and recommendations that will serve the Congress and the administration appropriately. Congress has appropriated about $38 billion since 2002 to rebuild Afghanistan. The President's fiscal year 2010 budget request includes additional funding for Afghanistan, which would bring funding for Afghanistan to about $50 billion through 2010. Together with my colleagues uh, at this table, CIGAR certainly is committed to providing the oversight needed to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse, and promote the effective implementation of the reconstruction program in Afghanistan. We are members of the Southwest Asia Joint Planning Group and its Pakistan-Afghanistan Subcommittee on Afghanistan and Pakistan, which uh, serve as forums for coordinating our work. All of that which is said to suggest that we do coordinate. Also, in our investigations work, we collaborate with the National Procurement Fraud Task Force and the International Contract Corruption Task Force. SIGAR has grown from an office of two to an office of 46, with, with an uh, additional 17 prospective employees in the pipeline. We have offices in Arlington, Virginia, and in uh, Afghanistan, where we have uh, offices in Kabul. Uh, today, 12 located at uh, the embassy in Kabul, uh, and we are uh, leaning towards uh, 20, which we have negotiated by way of the NSDD process with uh, the ambassador and the Department of State. We have personnel or office space in several other locations in Afghanistan, including Bagram Airfield as well as uh, Kandahar uh, Airfield. Bagram in the, the province of um, Pawan and Kandahar, the province of Kandahar. While growing, we have watched closely as the U.S. government has developed and, ex and expanded policy in Afghanistan. And I wish to note the extraordinary work of uh, Ambassador Holbrook, who recently testified before this very committee. Uh, he has consistently highlighted the importance of oversight in the new Afghanistan-Pakistan strategy. Over the past several months, CIGAR has met regularly with senior U.S. government officials in both Washington and Afghanistan. In Kabul, we attend the meetings at the embassy. We have 
uh, also built a strong network among the agencies, the international community, and the military components throughout Afghanistan. These meetings, together with our ongoing work, help us monitor the administration's development of a new approach in Afghanistan. And of course, we are using this information as a basis to adapt and expand our oversight plans. We work continuously with members of the oversight community to make sure that oversight work is uh, coordinated and not duplicative, targets the highest priority areas, aims to produce positive change, and does not overburden the U.S. civilian and military personnel who are implementing the reconstruction programs. We are keenly aware that it is our job to find and document waste, fraud, and abuse with the express purpose of working to improve the U.S. assistance program and identify wrongdoers. Likewise, we are poised to identify lessons learned. Our mission is difficult. It has taken time to hire staff capable and willing to do this work in a dangerous environment. However, we have made considerable progress. As of last week, we have issued four mandated quarterly reports to uh, this Congress and five audit and re inspection reports, each with recommendations uh, for improved processes and corrective action. Another three draft reports are currently at the agencies for comment as we speak. Uh, we have 21 ongoing audits and inspections, and we expect to issue five or more reports before the end of this month. SIGAR's investigative work has resulted in over $4 million in cost of audits uh, in one case, and the guilty pleas of two people offering $1 million in bribes for contracts in another. Our investigators are working 25 other active cases as we speak. Our work has identified problems with contract oversight, the lack of integrated information on reconstruction activities, and concerns with sustainment capacity. The impact of oversight cannot be measured solely by statistics. We believe that being on the scene is a real deterrent to waste, fraud, and abuse. We also operate a hotline given, uh, giving uh, U.S. coalition partners and the Afghan citizens various methods by which to report allegations of waste, fraud, and abuse related especially to the reconstruction efforts. The hotline has produced a number of credible leads that we are, of course, um, pursuing. We are working hard to pro produce and provide the robust oversight essential for the successful implementation of reconstruction programs in Afghanistan, and I welcome your questions thereunto pertaining. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Hedell. Uh, Chairman Tierney, uh, Ranking Member Flake, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning. Mr. Chairman, oversight in Southwest Asia, with emphasis on Afghanistan and Pakistan, is one of my top priorities. It is my goal to ensure the health, safety, and the welfare of our troops and to ensure that taxpayer dollars are being spent wisely. Our current efforts include increased oversight by enhancing our in-theater presence and ensuring comprehensive and effective interagency coordination. The oversight we provide through audits, investigations, inspections, and assessments truly makes a difference, especially in such an unstable and dangerous region where the Department of Defense operations and troop levels are increasing. Earlier this year, President Obama announced a comprehensive new strategy to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat al-Qaeda in Pakistan and Afghanistan, and to prevent their return to either country in the future. This strategy will involve several departments and agencies in our government. We have conducted oversight on Pakistan in 2003 and again in 2009, and started oversight efforts in Afghanistan in 2004. And we are increasing our resources in the region to ensure proper oversight and staffing in regard to the new strategy and the buildup of U.S. forces and programs in Afghanistan. To support our oversight, we have established field offices in strategic locations in Southwest Asia. We also utilize an expeditionary workforce model to support our efforts. This helps facilitate timely reviews and reporting of results while minimizing disruption to the warfighter. Our central field office in the region is located at Bagram Airfield. With the support and endorsement of the Commander U.S. Central Command, we have staffed new offices in Kandahar and Kabul 
with 14 deployed personnel, six investigators, and eight auditors. In addition, our staff travel as needed for field work in Afghanistan. Currently, there are five auditors and two engineers, for instance, on temporary travel in Afghanistan, and I will be traveling there myself in the near future to meet with General McChrystal and other commanders in theater. I have created a new key position within the DOD Office of Inspector General to ensure that there is effective coordination and communication within the oversight community within Southwest Asia. This position, the Special Deputy Inspector General for Southwest Asia, will report directly to me and act on my behalf to coordinate and deconflict oversight efforts. The DOD IG is the lead oversight agency for accountability in the department. For Southwest Asia, including Afghanistan and Pakistan, there are three critical coordination and planning mechanisms. The Southwest Asia Joint Planning Group, the Comprehensive Oversight Plan for Southwest Asia, and our many investigative task forces. In addition, in May 2009, the Joint Planning Group established a new subcommittee to coordinate audit and inspection work solely in, Af in Afghanistan and Pakistan. This subcommittee, chaired by the Inspector General for the U.S. Agency for International Development, Mr. Gambatisa, issued in August 2009 the Afghanistan-Pakistan Comprehensive Oversight Plan. I thank the committee for the opportunity to discuss our ongoing efforts, and I look forward to continuing our strong working relationship with Congress and all oversight organizations engaged in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Good morning, uh, Chairman, uh, Attorney, Ranking Member Flake, members of the uh, committee. Thank you for inviting me here to testify today on behalf of the Office of Inspector General for the U.S. Agency for International Development. I'm pleased to be here along with my colleagues from other oversight organizations with whom we work closely as we execute our audit, inspection, and investigative responsibilities in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Historically, my office has overseen programs in these countries from our regional office in the Philippines, increasing our staffing levels there as USAID funding in Afghanistan and Pakistan have increased. We recently established a full-time presence of foreign service officers in these countries, placing an auditor and a criminal investigator in Kabul and two auditors and a criminal investigator in Islamabad. These employees will be in addition to those currently providing oversight from our office in the Philippines. We also have a request uh, for three additional positions uh, uh, in Afghanistan. To date in Afghanistan, we have conducted 27 program performance audits in which we have made 84 recommendations for operational improvement of USAID programs. Moreover, we have issued nearly 30 financial audits that have identified more than $8 million in question costs of which 1.3 million was sustained. In addition to conducting audits, we investigate allegations of fraud and waste in these countries. In Afghanistan, we have opened 44 investigations that have, that have resulted in eight indictments, nine arrests, and three convictions, and savings and recoveries have totaled $87 million. I want to mention just two of our recent investigations involving security contracts in Afghanistan. In one, a defendant pled guilty to conspiracy this past week for his role in a scheme to solicit kickbacks in connection with the awarding of private security contracts. In another investigation, four individuals and a security company they worked for were indicted after they obtained reimbursement for fraudulent expenses. The company and the individuals charged have also been suspended indefinitely from doing business with the government. One former employee is serving a two-year sentence and more than $24 million have been saved in connection with this investigation. In Pakistan since 2002, we have conducted five program performance audits and made 12 recommendations for program improvements. Our 23 financial audits conducted in Pakistan have identified approximately $6 million in question costs, of which $3.5 million was sustained, and we have several ongoing investigations in Pakistan. We in the oversight community have been working diligently for several years to coordinate our oversight activities in Afghanistan. Our criminal investigators work closely with the National Procurement Task Force, which is established by the Department of Justice to identify and prosecute fraud associated with government contracting. 
We are also members of the International Contract Corruption Task Force, an interagency law enforcement group that coordinates contract and procurement fraud investigations in high-risk international locations such as Iraq and Afghanistan. A, a new coordination group, which Mr. Hadell mentioned, uh, which we chair, was formed in June of 2009 in response to the administration's focus on Afghanistan and Pakistan. This subgroup of the Southwest Asia Planning Group consists of representatives from the uh, uh, organizations you see with me here today. The Afghanistan-Pakistan subgroup issued, issued an oversight plan in August of 2009. I have submitted a copy of the plan with my written testimony and asked it to be made part of the record. This plan corresponds to the strategies developed by the U.S. government for assisting Afghanistan and Pakistan in addressing high-priority issues. The five areas addressed in the plan are security, governance, rule of law, and human rights, economic and social development, contracting oversight and performance, and cross-cutting programs. The subgroup will monitor this plan and make adjustments as necessary during quarterly meetings. The members of the Afghanistan-Pakistan subgroup have been working together to address oversight in this region for several years, and I am confident that we are effectively coordinating with one another to provide the best oversight possible. I want to emphasize, however, that oversight is a shared responsibility, that of the Inspector General community and the agencies we oversee, as well as the contractors and grantees who implement foreign assistance programs. We must all be vigilant to ensure that tax dollars are not wasted. Thank you again for inviting me here to testify. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Ambassador Geisel. Chairman Tierney, Ranking Member Flake, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to discuss the Department of State OIG oversight plan and our coordination and planning efforts with other IGs to provide oversight of U.S. resources and projects in Pakistan and Afghanistan. I also led this office from 1994 to 1995, and I'm very pleased with the significant increase in oversight that OIG is conducting around the world. The State Department OIG is an original member of the Southwest Asia Joint Planning Group, responsible for coordinating the work of IGs active in this broad geographic region. This past spring, the PACAF subgroup was formed to better focus on oversight related to Pakistan and Afghanistan. I'm pleased to report the PACAF subgroup is working quite well. In addition to formal, regularly scheduled monthly meetings, members take part in weekly and sometimes daily discussions. We are acutely aware of the difficulties in working in Pakistan and Afghanistan and the burden that our staffs can place on U.S. personnel working in those countries. Therefore, we are committed to avoiding redundancy and maximizing our effectiveness. Let me begin with Pakistan. Our Middle East Regional Office, MERO, will conduct a review this fall of the current management control environment at Embassy Islamabad in anticipation of a significant increase in funding and program implementation during the next five years. Merrill will assess risk and vulnerability associated with achieving current and new program objectives. Our plan is to use this risk and vulnerability assessment to drill down and conduct more thorough examinations of those programs and activities designated as most vulnerable to waste, fraud, and abuse. As we learned from Iraq assistance programs in 2004 and 2005, effective management controls are needed at the initial stages of assistance implementation. Additionally, in 2008, Merrill completed a review of the Fulbright program in Afghanistan. Our Office of Inspections will conduct a full post-inspection of Embassy Islamabad in calendar year 2010. Post inspections thoroughly cover every aspect of department activity managed by the embassy. In August, OIG and Embassy Islamabad agreed to have Merrill open a five-person office at the embassy to monitor department programs. Our auditors and analysts will be stationed in Pakistan, supplemented as needed with additional OIG staff to provide the necessary oversight. MERO has effectively used this staffing model at Embassy Baghdad and plans to open a similar-sized office at Embassy Kabul this month. We expect to have our MERO office in Pakistan open in early 2010, as funding levels permit. Now I'll talk to Afghanistan. Our Office of Inspections will be in Kabul this October inspecting the mission and should issue a report later in 2009. About 12 inspectors, including a highly experienced team leader, a former ambassador will conduct the post inspection of all mission aspects, including contracting, mission programs, consular affairs, and security and protection. 
Additionally, the Office of Inspections will issue a report later this month on the Department's demining program in Afghanistan. In August, we released a Merrill report covering the performance of U.S. Training Center, formerly Blackwater, under the terms of its Afghanistan contract. Merrill also is participating in joint state DOD audit of the Afghan National Police Training and Mentoring Program. They will report at the end of this year. Looking forward to 2010, Merrill plans to work on a number of department-funded programs, including the following, following, refugees and internally displaced programs, public diplomacy, and the embassy's guard forces. Regarding investigations, in 2009, we created the Middle East Investigative Branch to conduct investigations in support of the department's expanding Middle East and South Asia missions. Meade's primary mission is to respond to criminal allegations and support investigative activities concerning department programs, employees, and contractors from Pakistan to Morocco with focused concentration on the high-value, high-risk areas of Iraq, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. To date, six criminal investigators are assigned to MEEB, with five posted overseas and one in Arlington, Virginia. We can move our personnel easily from these forward bases in the region, as needed, to Islamabad, Kabul, or other priority posts. We plan to increase MEEB staff at current posts, adding one in Baghdad, one in Amman, as 2011 funding permits. In 2010, we plan to add two staff to MEEB based in D.C. MEEB completed construction and staffing of its Cairo office in 29. During FY 2009, MEEB's investigative activities in Afghanistan includes six open investigations and four preliminary inquiries covering a number of alleged criminal violations. The committee asked how we would plan our oversight, uh, our oversight should the pending bills for increased foreign assistance to Pakistan provide an additional one and a half billion each year over five years. It is, there is clear congressional intent for an in-country presence by OIGs in Pakistan. We have been staffing Kabul and Islamabad with temporary deployments, and we will increase staff there as necessary. Successful funding either way will gratefully improve our financial position for our office in Islamabad, which opens in 2010. The priorities set in the current bills, governance, economic development, and investing in people, could touch on a number of state programs that we oversee and some that we share with the USAID OIG. This includes rule of law, international narcotics and law enforcement, education and cultural affairs, and democracy, human rights, and labor. Thank you for the opportunity to present this information to you today. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ambassador. Ms. Williams-Bridges. Chairman Tierney and Mr. Flake and members of the subcommittee, thank you very much for inviting me to testify to discuss our oversight in Afghanistan and Pakistan. <clears throat> and alongside my colleagues in the accountability community. Uh, since 2003, GAO has issued more than 30 reports and testimonies on U.S. efforts to disrupt, defeat, and destroy terrorism in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Our work has identified the need for greater attention on issues such as the development of a comprehensive interagency plan for Pakistan, building the Afghan National Security Forces, accountability over billions of U.S. assistance to Afghanistan and Pakistan, contract management and oversight of contractors, and U.S. counter-narcotics efforts. GAO's past work has recommended specific improvements needed in U.S. efforts that should be considered in the administration's future strategic planning and implementation. GAO found that several existing conditions, such as worsening security, poor infrastructure, and the limited institutional capacity of the Afghan government continue to create challenges for the U.S. efforts to assist with securing, stabilizing, and rebuilding Afghanistan and combating terrorism in Pakistan. To address these challenges, GAO has recommended that state, DOD, and USAID improve their planning, enhance interagency coordination, increase police mentors for training the ANP, as you noted in your opening statement, Mr. Tierney, we have also recommended increased oversight of weapons provided to the ANSF and the um, coalition support funds provided to Pakistan. We also reported on the need for improvements in contract management and the numbers of oversight personnel with experience in contingency operations. 
Recently, the, the administration announced a new integrated civilian military campaign plan for Afghanistan, and we understand that the plan for Pakistan is being completed. State and DOD have coordinated their plans for Afghan National Security Force capacity building. In addition, DOD has taken steps to improve accountability for weapons provided to Afghanistan and coalition support funds provided to Pakistan. GAO has several ongoing reviews addressing a wide range of issues, such as the deteriorating condition in Afghanistan, building the Afghan army, U.S. contracting, and creating sustainable development programs in both countries. Like our colleagues in the accountability community, GAO works to improve the performance and accountability of government. GAO's authority, of course, extends beyond single departments or agencies in order to provide assistance and support to the Congress to make informed policy and funding decisions across government. GAO's policy and agency protocols require us to coordinate our oversight with other members of the accountability community, and we enjoy a very good working relationship with them. For example, as a member of the subgroup of Southwest Asia, a joint planning group, GAO meets quarterly with the IGs, and we submit our ongoing work for publication in respective documents. In addition to these more formal consultations, we regularly communicate with colleagues in various offices to ensure our work is coordinated and overlap is minimized. Inevitably, however, in developing our audit plans, we often find that our planned work is quite similar in scope. Given the statutory mandates of our respective organizations to conduct audits and evaluate programs and activities that involve multiple agencies, the overlap in our planning is not surprising. However, we find that through the coordination groups that we have enjoyed and the fluid communication that occurs across our office, we are able to deconflict and avoid potential overlap. We have enjoyed particularly a very strong working relationship with SIGR as it has uh, stood up its organization over the past year. That's not surprising since many of the employees of SIGUR are former employees of GAO and my team in particular. The U.S. personnel face enormous challenges working in Afghanistan and Pakistan. The security situation limits their movements and their ability to monitor projects. And the surge of civilian and military personnel has strained housing and other logistical supports. It is in that environment that GAO and our colleagues in the audit community enter our embassies and our military bases in Afghanistan and Pakistan. As such, we work to minimize the burden our oversight places on program management staff. However, with additional U.S. resources and attention focused by this Congress and this administration on Afghanistan and Pakistan, there should be additional oversight to ensure accountability of U.S. efforts. GAO relies on testimonial evidence, documentation, as well as on-site verification to conduct our work. GAO has visited Afghanistan and Pakistan over 10 times in the past two years to ensure the integrity of our own work. Nevertheless, we have faced some challenges in conducting oversight in country due to the unstable security environment and the limited housing available to temporary duty travelers. We take steps to mitigate these limitations by taking advantage of opportunities to meet with key officials in more secure locations and when individuals travel to Washington. We also, whenever possible, take advantage of technology such as video conferencing. To enhance our ability to conduct our work, however, GAO has established a steady presence in Iraq. We've been there since January 2008. We have three staff that are stationed there on six-month rotational basis. This has proved invaluable to our ability to conduct oversight in Iraq. With the challenges confronting the U.S. government for a successful drawdown in Iraq and the significant increase in troop presence and resources planned to execute our new strategy in Afghanistan and Pakistan, GAO has recently initiated an assessment to determine our requirements in the region as a whole. We plan to explore several options, including alternative TDY locations in Afghanistan and Pakistan. In closing, we recognize that carrying out oversight responsibilities in insecure areas will never be easy or without risk. 
As importantly, we recognize that the men and women, both civilian and military, serving our country there endure hardships and risk to perform the work critical to achievement of our national security and foreign policy goals. My colleagues at this table and I know that we must be judicious in our presence and mindful of any unintended additional burden on our diplomats and service personnel. GAO stands ready to assist the Congress in its oversight efforts and will continue to closely coordinate with our colleagues in the accountability community. Stand ready to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate all of your opening statements, which were uh, significant in, in their content as well, but I'm, I'm stricken by the fact that people watching this, perhaps or anything like that, are thinking that we're all accountants, we're all <laughs> auditors, and we sound like it sometimes on that. And, we're, and it's unmistakable that we have to do this to, to cover the ground. Um, you described very well the organizational structures that you have and the, and the cooperative efforts that you're making, but I haven't heard a lot about investigative strategy. Uh, and I'd like you all to comment on that a little bit, um, thinking it goes beyond the five areas that the pre President identified. I mean, you've all said that you're going to take a look at those, but what is the strategy there? What types of investigations are your high priority? Um, you know, are you worried about implementation? Are you worried about results? What about sustainability? You know, which is the priority on that? What are you going to attack? What's the strategy going on that basis? Uh, I know that in uh, one of the testimonies, there was conversation about uh, training and, uh, and reconstruction, obviously, but what takes priority and, and what are we really focusing on? And how do you establish or assess uh, where you're going to go for the fraud, waste, and abuse? Um, so we start in the middle there with Mr. Gambatisa on that. You probably have to push that button again. It's uh, am I on now? Okay, yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, sir, you, you mentioned investigations, but uh, are you referring to both audit and investigations, yes. or basically our, our overall plan? Um, I, I guess in, in the simplest terms, I can say that you know we follow the money. Wherever the large programs are, we uh, gear our, uh, our audit to those, uh, to those areas. So you uh, focus, uh, if there's a lot of money going in one area, that's the principal consideration. Uh, nothing else, not the impact of the program on security or the impact of the program on development or whatever. It's basically just where the money is that you're. Well, I, I, your I, it's really a, a combination, but I mean, with limited, we only have so many people to do it. So we try to focus on the largest impact, both, both from a financial standpoint and uh, what's important to the government. Okay. Um, I'm going to get back to you on that then in terms of the personnel on that. Ambassador? Well, uh, we have, uh, uh, I think we all have the common situation uh, that we are both planning and reacting. Uh, so if you're talking about investigations, criminal investigations, most of the time uh, we, we are reacting uh, to information that we've obtained. Uh, you've, you've seen some of it in the, in the I, newspaper. I understand that. I don't mean to cut you short, but I mean, sure. let's talk about those things where you take the initiative, those things that you go in with a design on that and tell us what your strategy is there, what your priorities are. Exactly. And, and uh, like my colleague has, has said, it, some of it is going where the money is, but a lot of it uh, is looking for where it's the most impact, where we, where, we, uh, where we see great risk to the United States. And that's not always uh, where the most money is. Exactly. We also do one other uh, area which is very important, and that is inspections. And the good thing about inspections is that we can be much more open uh, we can take a much broader point of view. Uh, most of the work is actually publicized. And in both Afghanistan next month and in Pakistan early next year, uh, we will be using large teams of investigators, in inspectors I should say, uh, to develop leads, if you will, uh, leads on the ground to work with uh, embassy management and other uh, embassy staff and figure out where we're going. They're, they're the obvious uh, bureaus that we're going at, uh, drugs and thugs, if you will. Uh, but uh, a lot of it is going to be looking for ourselves and then seeing this is where we want to go. Right. Mr. Hedell? Uh, yes, sir. The um, uh, Department of Defense, uh, Defense Criminal Investigative Service, um, I think is playing a major role in Southwest Asia. And um, in fact, I would go so far as to say that it's a leadership role, and it is about impact. I mean, the, the, uh, the days of statistical uh, results don't mean, make a lot of difference anymore. It's about impact. And uh, for instance, 
um, uh, the, the high impact work today isn't done by one criminal investigative agency. It's done by task forces. For instance, we're very involved in the um, National Procurement Fraud Task Force. We're very involved in the International Contract Corruption Task Force. These are, these are task forces that, that um, uh, look very closely at contract fraud, uh, major acquisition fraud, but most importantly, they work with other criminal investi uh, uh, bureaus like the FBI, uh, alcohol, tobacco, firearms, uh, and so on. But our focus is uh, to prevent as much as it is to prosecute. For instance, uh, we are very involved in education in Southwest Asia, teaching those um, procurement and contract officials what to be looking for. Right now, for instance, we're very involved in, um, in a, uh, a special project up in Rome, New York. We're looking at $14 billion in payment uh, vouchers related to Army purchases. Um, it's not very glamorous or exciting, but out of that will almost certainly come some very important investigative work that will lead to criminal prosecutions in Southwest Asia. Uh, what kind of work are we, are we doing? Uh, Defense Criminal Investigative Service, there, we're, we're fo we focus on technology. I know, my time has expired. I just want to interrupt you. So I get it that, that you're focusing mostly on criminal investigations and Janice would be more reactive, as the Ambassador was saying, on that to leads or we're, things we're, of that nature. We're, we're, we're not just re reactive. We're very, some education uh, as well. we're very proactive, I would say. And I would go so far as to say that the Defense Criminal Investigative Service, probably one of the foremost investigative agencies in our government. Thank you. I'll get to the other two witnesses. My time's expired. I'm, I'm not ignoring you on that, but I want to uh, give a chance to Mr. Flake. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses. Ambassador Geisel, um, in your comments, uh, in your, your testimony, you refer several times to uh, PAC-AV. We're used to hearing AV-PAC. Uh, are you suggesting uh, some sh uh, shift in emphasis here? Um, I've not seen that in other testimony. But is state uh, leading the way there? <laughs> I hope not, sir. Uh, I, I just like the alliteration of PAC-AF more than AF-PAC. Uh, I think they, they both work. Is that just you, or <clears throat> are others, have others been instructed I, to do that? Or? You know, I better check that I didn't even mess up my testimony. It might have said AF-PAC. <laughs> uh, no, you, you, you refer to PAC-AF. Uh, PAC-AF, I should say. But everywhere else, we, we're we no, used I, to it. No, I have PAC-AF. I don't know whether my folks are, are pulling a fast one or not, but I, I don't think so. I, I, okay. <laughs> All right, just, just, just wondering there. Uh, sticking with you, Mr. Geisel, or Ambassador Geisel, um, the security uh, guards at the embassy have uh, brought us uh, as a country and as our, 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 our image in the region untold grief, just like Abu Ghraib and other things. What, who, who bears responsibility? It, it, uh, it seems uh, unlikely that knowledge of this was, was with the eight who have been fired so far that had to have been broader than that. Uh, can you enlighten us as to what's going on in that regard? I'll, I'll partially enlighten you, sir, because uh, it wouldn't be uh, surprising. I won't confirm that we have a criminal investigation underway, but I don't think you'd be too surprised. Uh, there are uh, two aspects that we are looking at. Uh, the first will be uh, criminal misconduct, and that I'm not going to speak about. But we also, when the inspectors come in, they will be looking at just what you asked about, and that is the oversight over this contract uh, and identifying just who failed on the job and who has to be held accountable. And, and that will be quite public. Well, just looking at that broadly, uh, for a committee like this, it, it uh, gives us a little pause uh, if we're unable to police the security guards at the embassy um, and how good a job we can do with other oversight uh, on, on broader issues. It, it gives me pause too, sir, and, and uh, I would say uh, that uh, of our security program, there are two major efforts. The, the program that was mentioned in the newspapers and, and in the media uh, is uh, the static guards. There is another area which uh, is equally, if not even more important, and that is what we call the Worldwide Personal Protective Service, and that is actually protecting our people uh, when, they, when they move. 
And uh, in that case, we've already done a very significant audit uh, all around the world. And the, the audits came out well. But you can count on the fact that there will be audits and inspections, because uh, I, I was, frankly, just like the Secretary, absolutely appalled by, by this information. Uh, General Fields, uh, what progress has the Afghanistan uh, High Office of Oversight made so far? And, and how are we working with them? Thank you, sir. Um, the High Office of uh, Oversight, um, as the subcommittee may know, is born out of uh, President Karzai's attempt to deal with um, corruption. I have met uh, personally uh, with the uh, minister who heads that organization, uh, my principal deputy uh, who is located permanently at embassy in Kabul, uh, works in support of the embassy's dialogue with that organization. Um, I'm pleased that it is uh, often running. Uh, there are some issues. It uh, does not have very much capacity in that it is a, an organization of only about slightly over a year old, and it really needs support. Let's, let's uh, I have cut been to asked. The chase. Do, you, do you have much confidence in that uh, that organization or body, sir? I am pleased that the initiative has been taken to address corruption and to put in place uh, this particular kind of device to help deal with it, which, uh, in large measure, is not really unlike work that many of us at this table uh, conduct. At the same time, uh, again, it needs support. It needs um, capacity, and I feel that uh, we, the United States, can help in that regard. Thank you. My time is up. I'm going to take the last second of your time. You know, uh, General, uh, I've met the same individual you're talking about. I've been to their offices and I've looked at it. I don't have a great deal of confidence, so I'm, I'm sort of shocked that you don't come to that same conclusion uh, on that. That you know, there's one thing uh, to have individuals sitting in a chair. There's one thing to talk about this whole deal, but I think there's will. Uh, I didn't get a great deal of satisfaction in thinking that there was a will from President Karzai and his staff to actually go at this issue and go at it hard. And one indication of that is, by your own admission, their failure so far to staff it up. Is that fair to say? That's, that's fair to say, Thank sir. You. Yes, sir. Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I guess uh, following up on what you just said, this is a, a very distinguished panel, but I think it would take an equally distinguished panel to think of a worse environment to try to to try to gauge corruption and to root it out. Um, uh, I guess the, the line that came to me when the chairman was just speaking is uh, the line from Casablanca where the gentleman says, gambling at Ricks? I'm shocked. I mean, this is, this is a government with just embedded. It is a culture of corruption. It, it, besides the fact that the president's leadership can best be described as weak, he just got reelected. And, on an extraordinary corrupt election. So now we're not only putting billions of dollars at risk, but I also think given the lack of accountability and transparency and knowing where things are, I, I think we're putting our young people's lives at risk. And the best and brightest of us all and you all, and almost unlimited resources, I, I don't have confidence that we can do this, that we can do the Afghanization um, effectively without widespread corruption, just because it's embedded in the culture. And uh, I, I guess I want your reaction of what gives you some hope that in that land with limited access and extraordinary dangers and a culture of corruption, we should have any faith at all that despite your best efforts, we aren't putting our folks at risk and wasting billions of dollars? Anyone? Sure. Yeah, there we go. Well, I think that the, uh, I, I certainly think you have every, every uh, reason to, to make that statement and there is there's a tremendous amount on the line here. A uh, tremendous amount of America's wealth is in Southwest Asia. And I think that uh, people here at this table and uh, other members of the Inspector General and Oversight Community who are in departments, who oversee programs 
and operations and budgets that are related to Southwest Asia, and particularly now Afghanistan and Pakistan, are concerned. But, but I would also say that we have come a long way as an oversight community since 2003. I think we've learned a lot. I think the Department of Defense has learned a lot, and there have been some great lessons to be learned. We have taken issues that were identified in Iraq, and we have transferred this, identified the solutions and transferred those to the operations in Afghanistan. And I can give you examples of that. So I think there's reason for optimism. The second thing is in 2007, the oversight community um, established by the leadership pretty much here at this table, established the Southwest Asia Joint Planning Group. It's chaired by the Inspector General Department of Defense. Over 25 members of the oversight community. Tremendous example of now working together, identifying problems, joint problems, reducing redundancy, uh, identifying the gaps, areas that ought to be looked at that are not being looked at, identifying new issues, We've got people every day in Southwest Asia on the ground, auditors, investigators, meeting regularly with the commanders. So now a commander doesn't have to wait for three or six months or even a year to get a report. He or she finds out right away what's happening, and they can make corrective action almost immediately. So we're very proactive here. We've made some significant steps forward in the last several years. The Department of Defense OIG, for instance, alone, we've doub doubled our uh, audit and investigative staff over the last 12 months. Now, the numbers aren't great. We've gone from 6 to 14, but that's, that's significant. We have, we have almost doubled our entire Southwest Asia audit and investigative uh, workforce. And, and in the next 12 months, we're going to do more. We're going we're to increase that even significantly more. The point is that we're all trying to get ahead of the curve here. And if you look at it in terms of 2003, we've come a long way. But what we did yesterday is not good enough for today. And what we're going to do tomorrow is going to have to be a heck of a lot better than we've done. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could interrupt. Just, I recognize your best faith effort. All I'm suggesting is because it affects the decisions we're going to have to make on the President's recommendations, that. It sounds like what you're telling us today is that you're making improvements on what you're doing. And I think the response, and I don't see an answer that tells me otherwise, is as long as you're going through the Afghanistan, as long as you're going through Afghanistan's government, there is no reason anyone should have faith that money won't be wasted and lives won't be put at risk. Uh, I'd like to take a, a, a shot at it, if, if I might. Uh, in a way, we're, we're luckier than, than uh, you are because we don't make policy, we do oversight. Uh, and that means, as far as I'm concerned, we have to continue to inspect and audit what are very important programs uh, without saying whether it's a good idea, the policy is a good or, idea or not. We, we leave, leave that to the President and to the Congress. Uh, there are very important programs that we want to give our best to. Uh, for instance, the, the rule of law. Uh, and anti-corruption efforts, which I think are arguably the most important uh, uh, efforts we at State OIG are looking at. Now, regardless of whether these programs are going to succeed or not, we are going to give it our best efforts as long as uh, you tell us to, to be in Afghanistan. Mr. Chairman, I'd also like to respond to Mr. Uh, Quigley's uh, question and comments. Um, a couple of things. One, I think, is that we here, at the U.S. accountability community, if you will, can't do it alone. There is a global accountability community with whom we must also engage. GAO does this regularly um, by having consultations and creating working groups with other national audit offices. We are engaged now in a capacity building exercise with the Iraqis National Audit Office, and we look to do this on a more regional basis. So we have to look to share the knowledge that we have in order to create partnerships with other accountability partners. Afghanistan's um, National Audit Office is in its nascent stages, but we've seen significant growth in other national audit offices as well. 
I think the frustration, maybe, if I say, is like a day, a day, short, day late and a dollar short. Uh, I mean, this thing's been going on since uh, 2002, 2001, and now we're starting to talk about what we're going to do finally, and I think that's maybe indicative of some of the frustration here on that basis. Mr. Duncan, you recognize. Well, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the fact that you and uh, Ranking Member uh, Flake are continuing to try to um, um, oversee the, um, all the um, really unbelievable spending that is going on in this uh, uh, part of the world. Uh, because we uh, uh, so um, flippantly talk about trillions now where we were talking about billions, I think we really lose sight and can't really comprehend the uh, astounding amount of spending that's um, going on in this uh, area. And in fact, uh, uh, General Fields mentioned that we'll be up to 50 billion in rebuilding Af Afghanistan by the end of 2010. And yesterday's Washington Post, it says that um, the pending uh, 2010 budget uh, uh, has uh, 129 billion budgeted for uh, spending in um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Iraq, and for the first time, we'll be spending uh, over half of that or more in the Afghanistan, Pakistan region, 68 billion as opposed to 61 billion. No one really can humanly comprehend how much even one billion is, and so these uh, are amazing uh, amounts of money that we're talking about, and I certainly uh, have no criticism of any of the witnesses here because if we're going to be spending that kind of money, uh, we need to have uh, uh, people like this making sure that it is being spent in an honest uh, and uh, not wasteful way. But th the point I would like to make is is that uh, we shouldn't be spending all this money in the first place. We're spending money that we don't have. Uh, our national debt is reaching uh, $12 trillion now. Nobody can comprehend that kind of figure. But uh, now they're going to have to come to the Congress once again to raise the uh, debt limit once again. It's, it, it's just uh, unbelievable what we're doing. And uh, uh, I, I'm saddened that it seems that um, criticism of these efforts has been limited primarily to uh, uh, liberals until uh, a few days ago, uh, uh, George Will uh, uh, finally started to question some of this because uh, I have said many times, and I still believe, that fiscal conservatives should be uh, the people most upset, most concerned about uh, all of this uh, uh, um, amazing uh, uh, spending. It's just uh, uh, mind-boggling in, in a way. and, and um, uh, General Petraeus said a couple of months ago that uh, we need to remember that uh, Afghanistan has been known through the centuries as the graveyard of empires. Now, uh, I'm sure, uh, being the good bureaucrat that he is, though, uh, uh, he, I don't suppose there's ever been any real spending by the Department of Defense that he's ever really opposed. And that's one thing that I think uh, fiscal conservatives are going to have to realize at some point that the that the the defense department is first and foremost a gigantic bureaucracy and like any gigantic bureaucracy it always wants to expand its mission and always wants to get increased funding now i uh, i have the greatest respect for those in the military and i believe that national defense is probably the most important most legitimate function of a national government but I also uh, don't think that that means that we just automatically should approve every huge increase and in every military adventure that the Defense Department or any other department requests. Because I will go back to what I said a few minutes ago. We're spending money that we don't have, and we're really uh, putting in great jeopardy the future. Uh, I used to say of our children and grandchildren, but now I say uh, uh, of ourselves because I don't believe it's going to be 10 or 15 years before, if that long, before we're not able to pay all of our Social Security and veterans' pensions and all the other things we've promised our own people. So uh, I wish all these witnesses well, and I commend you, Mr. Chairman, for, for uh, holding this hearing. But I think, uh, uh, I think we need to... Uh, uh, realize that uh, we can't afford to keep doing what we're doing in Afghanistan and Pakistan and keep expanding 
our mission to increase in increasing our spending over there. We're going to increase our troops to the uh, by the end of the year to 68,000, and in all of these areas, we're having as many or more civilian contractors than we are uh, military troops. And and at, at some point, we we've got to come to our senses and realize that we just simply can no longer afford this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Duncan. You know, I think the concern here is that obviously we're all looking at uh, yet another strategy uh, for Afghanistan, uh, and this is that uh, obviously uh, there's a military component to it, and some troops are probably going to be recommended by General McChrystal. Uh, but there's this whole development piece that's supposed to be an investment that people are going to make uh, on that, the rule of law, uh, training of police and, and other security forces. But I want to take a quote from uh, Inspector General Fields' written testimony. It is, the current security situation is neither conducive to building and repairing nor the developing Afghan capacity to hold elections, provide justice, or meet the basic needs of the Afghan people. Uh, the efforts haven't been effective. And they're replete with accountability problems. That's the crux of this. I mean, that's why you're all here, because I think we all acknowledge that very statement, that this has been a mess. Uh, whatever you want to attribute the problem are, we've, we've had a situation that hasn't got the attention it should get since 2001. Uh, how deep are we into this thing with a culture of corruption, but also a practice of corruption, and corruption being embedded in the official uh, representatives that are being put in the government uh, of Afghanistan, and we have other situations over in Pakistan. So how are you going to proceed? You know, how are we going to proceed and what are the resources we're going to apply to that? And I would suspect uh, that uh, we're going to do something about trying to put in place standards and processes before we start spending the money, hopefully, uh, particularly in areas like Fatah, Northwest Frontier Province, uh, other really difficult areas in both countries to go into. So has there been some consideration about not just spending the money before processes are in place, and if there are those kinds of considerations, would you tell us what they are and how they're expecting to implement them? I mean, I suspect that uh, I know that uh, Mr. Hadell mentioned a lot of this is educational preventative. So I'm hoping that you're out there on the ground ahead of time, saying to all of the people that are going to get the money, here's some advice from us ahead of time before we come in and audit you and investigate you and and go out at that end. Here's what you can do to avoid a bad audit and a bad investigation. And here are what we're going to look to to have in place systems uh, and processes. And then hopefully we're not going to start spreading out the money until we're satisfied from reports of all you people those things are in place. Would somebody like to respond to that? Mr. Hedell, you want to start? Uh, yes. Uh, I yeah. I think you might have to move it a little closer. Okay. Thank you. The the oversight commu community is is not the one spending the money, but we're trying to identify where it's going and whether it's going properly and, be, and being spent in the That's right clear. way. That's clear. We're not blaming in, you for spending the in money. In 2008, 2008, we uh, issued a, what we call a summary report. It included 302 reports and testimonies of uh, not only the DOD inspector general, but uh, the um, the military audit services, the Navy, the Air Force, the Army, um, Special Inspector General for uh, Iraq, and GAO. And we, in this, three, this look at 302 reports, we issued over 970 recommendations. So the, we're following up on every one of those. I was just going to ask you that. It's like that's a lot of recommendations that are not doing anybody I can tell you right worth the good unless somebody's, you know, drilling down and making sure they're happening. Yes, sir. I apologize for interrupting you. I, I can tell you right now that uh, we are keeping, we're tracking this. 70 to 80 percent of those 900 plus recommendations are being addressed by the Department of Defense. And uh, many of them have been resolved. So there is action. But action only occurs when there's follow up. And that's one of our most important programs is that's to great. follow up. And, what, and I would. Give us for the record because we I have, think it's we an have a copy. We've read it. Most of us have read it, but we're happy to have it again if you like. But you know, that's the idea of following up on recommendations made, and I think that's essential. Uh, but I'm also talking here about a little bit of preventive acting, or, or, or you know, trying to get people to know that what's the right course before you get down the path on that. Do you want to provide that you, as well? I would offer another one. Uh, preventive. We we learned in Af in Iraq that uh, electrical systems. This may sound fundamental, but electrical systems are deficient. Um, Americans died needlessly, needlessly. 
And, and those lessons are learned and being transferred to Afghanistan. That, that, I understand that's great in, in those case by case. But I'm really talking about a broader strategic path here. You know, we're going to have people spending development money in Fatah, in the Northwest Frontier Province, and remote areas of Afghanistan. So the first problem is, do they have in place processes or standards that they know that they have to meet uh, on that? And the second thing is, if we can't physically get there ourselves, what do we have in place to do that? Ambassador, do you want to take a stab at that, or Ms. williams Bridges? I'll let uh, my uh, colleague from uh, USAID uh, do most of the talking, but there, there's two points I'd like to make. The first is my staff has been kind enough to explain to me how AFPAC became PAC-AF. Uh, and the answer is it was uh, Ambassador Holbrook who started using uh, PAC-AF. Uh, actually, uh, the point that, that you made about trying to get ahead of the curve is exactly what I think this community is trying to do in Pakistan, okay. and for that matter, why I think you're holding this hearing, if I may be so bold. It's a large part of it. That's why I wanted to get to it. And. Uh, we are working with the embassy. Our inspectors will work with them. Our auditors will work with them, raising these various points. For instance, as, as you mentioned, and as we all know all too well, uh, it is going to be very, very difficult uh, to work in the FATA, the federally administered tribal areas. It's, it's really dangerous. And we are working together with the embassy to, in what I think are some rather imaginative ways to consider how we are going to perform uh, oversight uh, in what is a, a very challenging area. And at least we have the sad experiences in Iraq and in Afghanistan to guide us. Okay. Now, we're talking about a billion and a half dollars over five years, so it's yeah. a serious amount of money. I think the, this committee should want some comfort that, that before that money is dispersed, that these things are in place. And, and so I ask again, is there some mechanism, whether it's a trust account or somewhere that that money is going to reside until we're secure in the notion that it's not going to be distributed until there's something in place that gives us reasonable comfort that it's going to be spent wisely? Ms. Williams Bridges. If, if my colleague will let him, since he's got most of the money, I'll. I'll All, right. <laughs> All right, I'll get back to you on that. Oh, sorry, Jack. He's got most of the money, but not enough staff. I'll tell you yeah, that one yeah. thing. And then we're going to get to that a little bit here, too. Did, but, did you uh, want me to go? Mr. Uh, yeah. Earlier, I mentioned that basically in the audit world, we follow the money. And in our investigations, although primarily reactive, we do a lot of uh, fraud awareness training around the world. Um, and I don't have the stats, but we do hundreds of these training programs where we provide um, training to not only USAID personnel, but uh, um, representatives of contractors, subcontractors, and grantees. We actually get out and show them what to look for in fraud. So uh, I think in that proactive way, we, we do some of what you're looking for. Um, but then we're left with the problem of overseeing the contractors and subcontractors, whatever, because we've lost so much of our in-house capacity. We sometimes don't even have enough in your department alone to manage and oversee those contracts. Well, well, I think, I'm not speaking for USAID, but you know, historically, and, and many of our audits have shown that m many of the problems that they face, especially in conflict areas, is lack of staff, uh, lack, of, lack of trained staff, and lack of uh, people willing to go to those places to work. Um, now, they are on, the agency is in, a, in the uh, process of building their staff, um, and um, hopefully that will help. But, but certainly, in, in the past, they've, they've had a, a problem in that area. Well, do you mind if Ms. williams Rogers speaks oh, no, to you? Ms. williams -Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there are a couple of things, I believe, that can be done uh, in a preventive mode to ensure that our money is well spent. And in large part, it requires the help of the Congress. Um, there was mention early on of Ambassador Eikenberry's discussions of uh, looking at alternatives such as direct budgetary support, I believe, for Afghanistan. I have not seen his letter, but I look forward to reading it. But what we have clearly learned in the past, that while these type of efforts, direct tra uh, cash transfers or direct budgetary support, are good in intention and often result in very good outcomes uh, because presumably they are consistent, they allow there to be some consistency and anticipation and planning for what the needs are of the country that we are looking to serve. Oftentimes in the past we found that 
the monies that we have spent have not been consistent with the national needs or priorities, and therefore there has been a lost opportunity to really make big gains. But any direct budgetary support must come with the ability of the accountability community to access the records and the backup documentation that is kept there so that we can exercise some control and oversight, as well as the host country government can have some accountable system, some data that they can rely upon to ensure that the monies are accounted for and well spent. We've learned well in the past in our other investment efforts in countries where there is no such access that we have no ability to track and account for our investment made there. Uh, second, I would also ask the Congress uh, assistance and support and ensuring that in, when agencies respond to our recommendations, GAO's recommendations in particular, there is a requirement in law that the agencies respond within 60 days to the Congress, informing them how they intend to act on the recommendations that they've often agreed with uh, before we've issued our reports. We incorporate whether or not the agencies agree or disagree. Um, as is often the case in transitions in government, uh, the agencies aren't aware of this requirement. And so most recently in dealing with some of our uh, agencies that we are dealing with at this table, uh, we have found that those letters are just piling up in someone's room and not knowing where they should go or they haven't been prepared at all. Um, so we would be glad to work with the Congress to try and reinforce um, some of these mechanisms to assure not only responsiveness to past recommendations that will prevent misspending and fraud and abuse in the future, but also to ensure that there is access and accountability over any new investment that's made given any new direction that might be pursued. Okay. I'll get back to this again. I want to give Mr. Flake an opportunity here. Mr. Flake, thank you. Just to follow up on that uh, really quickly, uh, obviously the, the uh, government of uh, Afghanistan wants budgetary support. All of the governments do. And uh, you're, you're telling us that you'll make the recommendation um, or you have made the recommendation that that not be the case until we can access records that we clearly can't access right now. Is that the case? It's your, it's your contention that we wouldn't be able to have access uh, to how the money is being spent. Uh, even though we, we pretty much know that that's not a direction that uh, certainly I want to go here. Um, we have not made the recommendation because I have not yet seen this proposal and I don't know what stage this proposal is in. Uh, but given our past experience with direct budgetary support provisions. Right. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Mr. Gambatiza, you testified that you made uh, 84 recommendations uh, for operational improvement to USAID. Uh, programs. How many of these recommendations have been implemented? I, I don't have the exact number, but um, generally we get um, management decision on the majority of them. Uh, I'd have to get back to you on the exact number. I don't have that here. I'm sorry, you get. To I don't have that number right here with me. But you, you said generally you get. Generally, we get management concurrence on the recommendations we make. Uh, they, they don't object. I, I'm not aware of any of these where we've had an objection that we're not going to do what we recommend. And whether they've actually gone through and, and completed the recommendation, I'd have to get back to you on that. I don't, I don't have that right here. When were the recommendations made? How long ago? Um, the uh, information I was giving was over a four or five year period, so um, it, it's over that span. Okay, over that span, not, uh, and, and uh, so you, your anticipation is that most of them have been implemented. I, I would hope okay. they have been, but I can check and get back can you to you. Get back to us sure. on that. And uh, typically, if if they if they don't follow through and make the recommendations, uh, what what happens? What who who do you then go to, and say, hey, uh, you're not making the improvements, uh, not following our recommendations, and at what point is Congress informed? Um, is it through this regular process, or, or is, it, uh, is there a, a trigger that, uh, that forces you to come back to us and say, hey, these programs ought to be shelved uh, because they aren't following our recommendations? There, there is, in fact, a, uh, a process within the Inspector General's Act that uh, requires us to notify Congress if recommendations aren't acted upon in, uh, within a six-month period. Have you, or, when was the last time that you notified Congress? Uh, we have never had to. It's, well, in, in my tenure, we have not had to. Okay. Does that uh, go for everyone here, uh, the other, for the other agencies, state? Mr. G Ambassador Geisel, have you had the experience where you've had to come to Congress? And we had 
the answer is yes or no. Uh, to, uh, I'm informed that we actually had to report two instances of noncompliance uh, to the Congress. And that was with regard to Afghanistan or with, with, with uh, no, sir. No. So far, uh, so what we're hearing so far is that every recommendation made with regard to Afghanistan yeah. uh, has been implemented. Does that go yeah. also um, for defense? Mr. Flake, um, I've been in the, at the Department of Defense for about 14 months now. And during my time, I, I, I don't know of any instance where we have uh, exercised that um, re requirement. However, we do issue semi-annual reports to the Congress. Uh, in these reports are a list of, of uh, recommendations in a broad sense. So we do keep the Congress uh, fully apprised of, uh, of what we have found, what we are doing, and what we're monitoring. Right. General Fields, did you have a comment there? Thank you, sir. I wish to comment on the uh, follow-up to uh, recommendations. Uh, our first uh, report uh, in my capacity, given we are a new organization, uh, we uh, issued uh, several months ago, it was a report on $404 million of um, Afghanistan Security Forces Fund administered by uh, Systicker. And uh, we discovered that uh, there was insufficient uh, oversight of that particular uh, arrangement, that funding the execution of it. Uh, principally, the contract oversight person was uh, located in Maryland rather than in Afghanistan where the money is being executed. Uh, we are pleased to report that as soon as we uh, made this observation to Systicker and to U.S. Forces Afghanistan, uh, they began to um, address it. Uh, that included um, follow-up work by the uh, Secretary of Defense and, and other uh, oversight um, entities. So from that standpoint, speaking uh, exclusively for CIGAR, uh, there has been a response to uh, at least that report. There are several other reports that we have uh, issued, but uh, too early for immediate response to be uh, reported uh, to this subcommittee today. All right. Thank you. If I could follow up with one question. Uh, Ms. Williams Bridges, you, you mentioned that, uh, and all of you have mentioned, the security situation makes it difficult for you to carry out your work in Afghanistan. At what point, you know, for a committee like ours, um, where do we draw the line and say, security situation is such so we can't carry out our oversight functions, or security situation is so bad that perhaps we shouldn't be spending this money because we can't account for all of it. Uh, where do we draw that line? And I know it's a difficult situation. All of us have traveled to Afghanistan, and we recognize that uh, you can only have field offices or personnel in certain areas, and it's, it's a, a real uh, endeavor to, to go out, and, uh, and particularly in some of the areas we've been talking about. Uh, but but how how are we to navigate that uh, that line? I guess between security situation so difficult that we can't provide oversight, or perhaps is it so bad that we s simply shouldn't be spending these monies in these areas because we can't account for them? Uh, good question. Um, I'm, I'm glad to say that I don't believe that we've reached that point yet where the security situation is so bad that we believe that we cannot provide the Congress with um, meaningful information to help you conduct oversight over our engagement in country. Um, I think that we, and, and we would inform you if we believe that were a limitation to our ability to answer the mail, if you will. Um, I think that um, we have to take mitigating uh, strategies. We have to mitigate against the limitations that may be imposed on our ability to actually make field visits. For example, when I was in Pakistan a couple of months ago, we wanted to go to the Fatah, we wanted to go to Peshawar uh, to see some of the projects that the U.S. government had funded. We were not able to. However, we were able to extract enough data that we felt was sufficiently reliable um, from uh, the agencies to be able to conduct our work and to be able to analyze it to make some reasonable judgments as to whether or not there was good record keeping, whether or not we were on track with plans that we had made in country. But there are a couple of lessons that have been learned, and actually these lessons form the basis for military counterinsurgency doctrine. First is to establish security, first and foremost, establish security. Uh, before you proceed with reconstruction. We've learned this from Iraq. We've learned the uh, very hard lessons from Iraq of investment that um, has been in destroyed. 
our investment in infrastructure that was destroyed because the security was such an unstable situation. Uh, second is to create an economic foundation in that country that they can sustain the investment that we have made in country. Again, this goes back to what kinds of strategies do we need to think about going forward as we look to increase our investment there. Third is to extract the political commitment from the country that they are going to carry out those priorities that they've established, priorities that we join in with the country and create the basis for our own strategic goals in that country. Um, so I think that we need to continue to think of that as we move forward with any future investment. And certainly these are things that we are going to continue to monitor in our own oversight strategy to ensure that that investment is uh, well made and protected. Thank you. And I guess that the trick here is not to put the cart in front of the horse, uh, which I think billions of dollars in has been being done. Uh, I think most notably of the coalition support funds in Pakistan. Uh, when we were there and, and, and investigating whatever, we found $6.7 billion spent a large part which was not accounted for at all. Uh, and part of what happened was the money was basically paid to Pakistan, went into the general treasury, and at that you were at the mercy of either believing or not believing what was going on. But I do know that we looked at about 35 helicopters, uh, the money that was paid supposedly to have them repaired, and they were all sitting on the rampart there unable to move. Uh, so I mean, that's the kind of thing that, uh, that we're talking about here, that we need to get out in front of this on that situation. And as the uh, inspector, uh, Special Inspector General says, the current situation in Afghanistan is such that uh, it's not conducive to building or repairing, uh, nor is it conducive to developing the Afghan's capacity to even hold elections, which we've seen, or provide justice, or to meet the basic needs of the Afghan people. So are we going to throw money into the development side of that without resolving those issues first. And that we seem to be doing it with the right motivations and moving forward, um, but it's hard to do that. In Pakistan in particular, uh, I know that you were out there and, and we've been out there as well in the Fatah and, and uh, Northwest uh, Province area. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about how it is that you have so much faith uh, that we're able to do it. I, I know the foreign assistance in Fatah is, uh, according to the Special Inspector, being accomplished with the use uh, of non-U.S. implementors. Right, basically, we're contracting it out or we're going to locals. <laughs> but when we were there, uh, you know, we couldn't get much further out of the Peshawar. Uh, and the people there told us, the non-governmental um, organizations told us, our own consulate told us, they couldn't get anywhere near where the projects were happening, whether it was an irrigation project, whether it was a well, whether it was a school. And so they were trying to use flights, uh, overhead flights. They were trying to use the word of mouth from other people who had been out there or whatever. How reliable is that? Uh, let me clarify. We heard the same thing when we were on the ground as we met with um, uh, local nationals, as we met with agency officials, we met with the Secretariat of the FATA. We are in the course currently of evaluating our development assistance efforts in the FATA. We have not reached our conclusions yet. But what I'm saying is that we were able to get data that we believe that we can rely on from the agencies to be able to conduct our analysis. Okay. So we have not yet reached our conclusions. Having done all the things that you've done on that, I'm more skeptical than you are. So okay. I'd like to see your report and the foundation for your reaching that conclusion you know, on that because we, we I think it's an important we'll matter here. It's, you know, $1.5 billion heading in that direction. Um, you know, we want to make sure it isn't going in the wrong direction on that. Agreed. Uh, the C-Sticker situation, the Combined Security Transition Command in Afghanistan, uh, that is a serious matter. Obviously, we had all of those weapons with a potential that they might not be accounted for. Um, is there follow-up going on for that? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, in fact, we have uh, we have done several reviews uh, relative to weapons and explosives accountability in in both Iraq and Afghanistan. We uh, we did find uh, that there were concerns. We've also found that there have been corrections made. Uh, with respect to those in Iraq, okay. we are getting Can I ready. I in on, on just the Afghanistan so Well, we are that. now focused and have, in fact, we went to Afghanistan uh, last fall. We took a look at weapons accountability as well as right. uh, training and equipment right. sustainment. No, we had several reports on that, which is why yes, I sir. raised the question. We went out there and visited as well, and we were not satisfied at the time we went out there that enough had been being done. So uh, uh, you're answering now that you are looking up and following we, up on we, that. To we have follow-up work planned, um, um, uh, several things uh, that will be in motion uh, between now and next spring. Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, uh, the Special Inspector, I have a question for you about your part of the report indicating that obviously we're aware of salaries going to ghost employees in the security uh, divisions of Afghanistan. 
uh, and I think you're following up on that. Uh, but we also have a report in your uh, written remarks about some private firms uh, that are spending, you know, uh, international monies or whatever, hiring security people that may in fact be connected to the Taliban. Now, my question to you is, which flavor of Taliban uh, are, are they hiring on that basis? You know, and just you know, what is their, uh, you know, who are they? That particular group of Taliban. And uh, is that a dangerous thing for them to be doing that? Is uh, there something being done about it? If it is, could you elucidate on that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our work in this particular area is um, not complete um, at this time. Uh, but uh, this is a, a serious um, matter, at least um, to look at in terms of determining uh, if there is wrongdoing uh, and uh, if, in fact, the allegations that we have seen, especially over the past few days, uh, are, in fact, um, valid. But I'm not prepared, Mr. Chairman, at this time to report any of the results. But I just wished, though, to inform that um, these are matters that we are uh, looking into. When will you think that you'll have some uh, results on that particular inquiry? Sir, I would um, suggest uh, perhaps within the next, um, within the next month. Okay. Well, I think the sooner the better. It's a rather alarming concept that could be uh, looked at there. If it's the Taliban that are then turning around and focusing on our troops, international troops, uh, and against the Afghan government, then certainly we've got a major problem. If they're a different breed of Taliban, then we have to know about that as, as well. And so uh, I urge you to, uh, to move on that as quickly as you can. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Blake, do you have any questions you want to ask? Good. Go ahead. Are good? That's All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about the police training. And, and the Army training as well, but even more so about the police training there. Uh, and, and I would hope that uh, that's something that somebody in this group is going to look at uh, with depth. Uh, here we are, uh, 2009, nearing the end, uh, and there's the, the police training, there's corruption rampant on there. There uh, seems to be a, I know there's a great plan the Department of State has about training some people and switching them in. I, I think if we go on that basis by the year 2030, uh, we ought to have covered the country and be ready to start again. And, that, and so that's a difficulty there. Uh, who's taking the lead on determining what the status uh, of training the police in Afghanistan uh, is? We, we will be following up on our past work looking at the uh, training and, and capabilities of the Afghan National Police. Right now we're, we are focusing our attention on the Army, but in the course of our follow-up work and in future work, we will definitely pay attention to the security capabilities. Well, we, we have a number of, of substantial witnesses before this committee who, who are quite knowledgeable about counterinsurgency uh, and the area that tell us that the police are every bit as important or more important. Uh, than the military on that. So I would hope that we could at least do them simultaneously as opposed to stacking the military first and the other. Uh, and we've seen in our own visits over there and, and talks with different people there that it's, it's critical that that be done. If the local population doesn't have any confidence in the legitimacy of their police force, Absolutely. Uh, we're in a terrible state of affairs on trying to do any of the other uh, theories that we have on that. So other than the Government Accountability Office, uh, is the CIGAR looking at that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We know too well that um, of the $38 billion to which I made earlier reference that the United States has invested in the reconstruction of Afghanistan, uh, over half uh, or about half of that money, about $18 billion really has gone towards the uh, Afghanistan National Security Forces. And um, a large body of our work uh, is, uh, has been done, is ongoing, and will be done to address uh, the significance of that uh, element of funding for the reconstruction. I mean, the fear is this. All right, there's a large amount of money that's gone toward that. That portion that was designated toward the security of the police may not be an investment. may have been wasted uh, on that. When you look at the state of affairs of the police in Afghanistan, uh, you know, I'm hard pressed to call that an investment to date. So the idea would be to get a report as quickly as possible on that as to what would turn that into an investment that would have some positive results. Uh, because we don't do that, all the people that we have over there, not just our military people, but all the people that work for you, all the people that are working in development or whatever, there is serious risk uh, on that. So I appreciate that if you, if you would do that. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, actually State uh, OIG and DOD OIG are uh, undertaking a joint uh, study of police training right now. And uh, our report uh, should be ready, uh, I believe, in December. Well, thank you for that. Um, should the CIGAR 
this role be extended to cover Pakistan as well? Or how are we going to address all of our oversight issues in Pakistan? Sir, we um, have looked at this uh, question, um, of course, well before this uh, announced uh, testimony. Uh, we have uh, dialogued with Ambassador Holbrook on this, and he made certain references to this issue uh, during his testimony in, in June. Uh, we, uh, from the CIGAR standpoint, support the idea of uh, extending our mandate uh, to assist in covering um, uh, Pakistan. Uh, for one reason, um, the inextricable, inextricable uh, linkage between Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, the fact that um, if the extension of our mandate uh, is similar to that which we currently have, which allows us to look across agencies, uh, we think that's a considerable benefit. Uh, we believe also that um, in spite of our relatively meager numbers right now, we could almost immediately uh, commence uh, some degree of oversight uh, of um, spending in Afghanistan and over a period of time with increased funding uh, leading to increased numbers of auditors, inspectors and investigators uh, build to a more substantial effort to uh, address this matter. Uh, we underscore the significance of oversight, which in the case of Afghanistan uh, may have started before CIGAR, but not at the time at which we began to invest significantly in the reconstruction of Afghanistan. And so we would not like to see this uh, happen in Pakistan as well. Now, sir, I, I say this not to be a wise guy or anything like that, but you are aware of, of some criticisms of uh, the Special Inspector uh, General's office in Afghanistan. Uh, I've been in the newspapers or whatever on that. Uh, so yes, sir. Address that for me, if you will. I mean, I think basically the criticism evolved around what they saw as a paucity of reports, uh, and they were comparing it to uh, the number of reports that had come out of Iraq in the in the comparable period of, at the outset of those offices. Uh, you had five reports, I think, over the course of your first year. Uh, and I, I guess there were many, many more in the Iraq uh, office on that. But given that criticism, if you address that and address would there be enough personnel and enough capacity in the Special Inspectors uh, General's office in Afghanistan to actually go over into Pakistan, and might we not be better off uh, trying to focus on some of other, our other agencies or another Special Inspector? Yes, sir. Um, first, uh, let me address the criticism aspect mm -hmm. um, of, of this office. Uh, the criticism, frankly, Mr. Chairman, is uh, not unexpected. Um, we were uh, late in getting funding to support uh, our effort, but this Congress has now provided the funding, uh, particularly as a part of the $7.2 million we received, uh, which complemented the $16 million that we had previously been provided, that really has rounded us to hire on the people that we informed the Congress last um, year about this time that we wanted to hire to get our work done. So uh, we, are, we are hiring the, the right folks to do the job. Um, we are not suggesting that we have excess capacity, but we are suggesting that it would be advantageous to the oversight community if uh, we were to link the oversight of Pakistan with that of Afghanistan. And given our now um, almost uh, full year of funded uh, oversight work, uh, we feel that that's, that perspective uh, is a valid one. Okay. The capacity of all of your offices uh, somewhat concerns me. Uh, Government Accountability Office, notwithstanding, they seem to be doing, you know, getting their people around pretty well or whatever, but I'm not sure, it, most uh, stressing I think is USAID, the in-house capacity that your office used to have. You have 210 foreign service offices and civil service employees. Uh, Mr. Uh, Gambatisa, what's the breakdown of that? How many of those are civil service employees and how many are foreign service officers? About 125 ballpark are foreign service, the rest are civil service. So they're covering 100 countries, billions of dollars. Correct. Now, there was a day yeah. when your capacity was substantially higher than that, am I right? I, I, I don't have that, that knowledge. I, I, I don't know personally. I can ask one of my staff. but. Okay. Um, we are in the process of staffing up. I mean, our budgets have been increased. Uh, we are getting the funding. Uh, I believe uh, we're in the process of trying to hire another 20 more, 20 auditors. And, um, and foreign uh, officers? Uh, foreign service, foreign mainly service. foreign service. Are but, you having difficulty finding people that are qualified? Um, not really. Um, the, um, um, we've hired probably um, 20 in the last six months. 
Um, many of them are very highly qualified. Uh, you have a difficulty uh, finding people that are willing to go to Afghanistan well, that's, and Pakistan. That's, that's the issue. Uh, whether they want to serve in those uh, countries, I think that's the limiting factor, more so than, than their qualifications as auditors. Of those 20, how, what percentage of those people were willing to go to Afghanistan? Well, they Pakistan? all have to be. They all have to be. So the Yes. If, if they're Foreign Service officers, they have to be uh, actually cleared both, um, uh, cleared medically, for example, to, to go to anywhere we, uh, we have offices or where we work. If, if it weren't for the fact that you were inviting them to go to Afghanistan and Pakistan, how many of that 120 slots would you have filled, do you think? I, I don't think it would be much different. I think we're doing quite well, but, but we certainly need to, uh, to staff up. Um, I, I did mention in my, um, in my written statement that we, uh, if the funding uh, proposed for Pakistan is, is actually appropriated, we, we will be um, asking to put an office there. Uh, a significant number of employees. And, and right now you're relying on a, a substantial number of uh, Pakistani and Afghanistani accounting firms, we, eight in one country, ten in the other, on that. You're training their people and moving forward. How confident are you that those people not only have the requisite skills that you've been training them with, but the will to do the job? Mm -hmm. uh, well, and what about a corruption factor there? Well, the, when we're dealing with private um, accounting firms, um, it, it's difficult to tell from the corruption standpoint. We, we provide them training and uh, contract with them to go places, for example, in the FADA where, where we can't go, right. and uh, both for financial audits and, and we are actually ac asking them to go and look at uh, programs from a performance standpoint to see if the building is built. And that's but because sort of we're not doing it in-house, we're then at the mercy of doing that because we don't have people uh, to go out and watch their work. If we do, we're certainly, you know, redoing the wheel here. We have people to go out and do the work, then we have our own people to see if they did the work. That, that's true. Uh, but a, so as, as we've all discussed, the security affairs. situation... I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, I just, it sounds like a tough state of affairs. Well, as we've all discussed, the security situation is such that uh, if we can't get out at all, this is, this is better than doing nothing, I guess. Uh, at least it's, it's, it's a, an effort at trying to, to get some eyes on, on the programs. Now, our trips out there indicated to us that, in fact, those folks weren't having that much of an easier time getting out there as well. Isn't that true? Well, I, I, I don't know that. We're, we're just beginning this program. Okay. Well, what we, and, and Ms. Williams, right, and Bridges, you can probably answer to that, but the indications are that uh, there's people that live in Fatah and people that don't. When people that don't live in Fatah get out there, they're not well received all the time. Same with the provinces. Is that correct? That's correct. In fact, when we were there in June, um, the U.S. Embassy retracted its personnel from the consulate in Peshawar because of the security situation. So I think we're going to have a difficult time no matter what. Would you like to ask him? Yeah. Uh, just to follow up a bit, and I, on uh, the first question I asked, uh, AVPAC versus PAC-AV, and uh, uh, that comes, we understand, now from Ambassador Holbrook, and it does, if that is the source, signal kind of a shift in focus, and we're hearing, uh, well, according to George Will, uh, Pakistan is a country that actually matters, as, as he put it. And, and I think we've seen s sort of a shift that uh, as Pakistan goes, so goes Afghanistan. That's the source. That's where the Taliban actually is. That's where we're going to be expending a lot of resources coming up. I, I think my concern, and it may be shared with the chairman and others, uh, the chairman mentioned that, uh, you know, we seem to be behind the curve all the time. You know, we're into this eight years, and we seem to always be having recommendations that are now going to be implemented uh, eight years later instead of putting the resources in place initially before we ramp up uh, the flow of resources to uh, these areas. And, and uh, my concern now is if there is a real shift in focus now, if it's PAC-AV and our resources are flowing mainly through Pakistan, that we're going to be in a situation a couple of years from now where we only put your resources in place uh, where the money has gone before. And, and we're just chasing, you know, with the tail uh, all the time. And uh, we never seem to be putting <coughs> structures in place to make sure these resources are expended properly after they're already in place. And uh, Ms. Williams Bridgers, you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, you would let us know if the security situation was such where we couldn't conduct appropriate oversight. Uh, but if the focus is PAC-AV now, we already know, as the chairman said, there are certain areas where we really aren't getting good information. And 
I guess some of us are a little skeptical that that will be the case, that, that we will be informed here where we need to make oversight decisions and funding decisions, uh, that, you know, the situation is such where we simply can't account rather than hearing a few years later, well, we're now catching up or trying to catch up to put these, this framework in place where we can expand. Can anybody give me any confidence that if the shift now is PACAV, and are we going to put the right framework in place in Pakistan in the areas that, that are concerning to us uh, before we expend the money, not after? Uh, Ambassador Geisel. Uh, I don't know that I'm uh, ready to assure you that everything is going to be fine. Uh, in fact, I know I'm not. Uh, but what I can tell you is at the uh, request of Ambassador Ann Patterson, who uh, was one of my successors the first time that I was acting IG, she, she followed Jackie, uh, our Middle East Regional Office is going to conduct a uh, review this fall of the current management control environment at Embassy Islamabad in anticipation just as you said, of a significant increase uh, in funding and, and program implementation during the next uh, five years. Uh, and as I told you, uh, we have moved up uh, a full inspection of the embassy in Pakistan just for that reason, uh, for that reason to, the, the to first, try and get ahead of the curve. The first concerning thing there is that we're still talking about a Middle East office when we're talking about Central Asia here. <coughs> and, yeah. uh, and, and it's a little concerning that we haven't it's it's, uh, it's it's a term of art. I hate. Uh, it, it's going to be uh, uh, the same office, albeit considerably augmented for Pakistan and Afghanistan. But I don't want to have one more bureaucracy. Uh, so no, you can count on it. It's not. Uh, it, it's going to be the same office that does that, but it's going to be a whole lot more people doing it. I. I Ambassador Geisel, I mean, you said right in your written report that effective management controls are needed at the initial stages of assistance implementation. I think that's, you hit it on the head with that. Uh, so we're going to need legislation here. Probably, I shouldn't ask you this policy question. It's not fair. So I'll just ask it as a rhetorical question. Are we going to need some sort of legislative mandate here that monies not be distributed and dispersed uh, until we're satisfied with reports back from you folks that, in fact, effective management controls are uh, in place for this assistance? And, and that would be something we'd probably we want to look to uh, reports of all of you. I think it's great that Ambassador Patterson, who, from what I can tell, is doing a, a good job in a difficult situation there, that she's now going to evaluate whether the Pakistan agencies and non-governmental organizations have the capabilities to ensure that proper management controls are in place and funds used as intended. Uh, I wish her predecessors had done that starting back at the beginning of the decade, uh, and we wouldn't be in this situation now. But it seems to me that that's the key here. Uh, that they're doing it, that they have the capacity to do it, that we can have some reliability and, and trust in them doing that. And, uh, and I'm reluctant to think that we ought to be spending this money. We ought to put this money appropriated perhaps and sit it somewhere until we get uh, some indication from all of you that those things are in place and ready to go. Otherwise, I think uh, any security issue that Ms. Williams Bridges puts in might be another factor on that uh, and, and talk about that. So I think you've given us great food for thought uh, on a number of different areas here today because I haven't heard a great deal of um, comment that gives us confidence that that is in case uh, being done. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, may, sir. may I interrupt uh, just to you add to that, make, sir? Sure. Um, something that might address um, uh, Ms. Mr. Flake's uh, question is a report, it's an assessment that the Department of Defense Inspector General issued in May of this year. It's classified, but it was an assessment, a review of all of the uh, um, DOD managed uh, funds and programs uh, that exist in Pakistan. Um, it's very revealing, I think. It would be very interesting. We could, we'd be more than happy to brief in a closed session regarding that, but it certainly gets to what Mr. Flake uh, to some extent was Thank was you. Asking. We would please set that up if Mr. Flake uh, cares to proceed with it and, uh, and follow on for that point. Just as long as I have uh, your attention, uh, Mr. Hedell, uh, Protective equipment for our troops, is somebody investigating whether or not there are sufficient standards for that equipment and whether or not our troops are getting the equipment in timely fashion? Are you asking whether or not the troops are getting the equipment? I'm asking whether or not we have somebody investigating or looking into whether or not they are getting 
the necessary protective gear and equipment that they need to do their jobs in a timely fashion. Absolutely. We, we've actually done a fair amount of work in, in that area uh, going back to 2006, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, uh, we did a review in Iraq, um, which um, it was... Well, that, uh, that's what spurs the question. Iraq, it was not so much. We, we, we found, sure we found concerns. Happened. We found concerns in Iraq. We believe that uh, uh, those have been addressed by the Department. We found issues not just with routine uh, uh, equipment, but we found uh, with uh, up-armored vehicles, uh, with armor. Uh, we're continuing to address those issues. At the same time, we're monitoring the Department that is also continuing to address those issues. And we're hopeful that the lessons we've learned in Iraq are being carried forward into Afghanistan. But these are complex issues. For instance, up-armored vehicles, um, um, what, what may have been very effective in Iraq because of the train in Afghanistan may require very different resources. So we're continuing to follow that. It is a concern of ours, and we can report in the future on, on what we found. Great. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman. Yes, ma'am. GAO is also currently undertaking a review looking at the supply and equipping of U.S. forces. We're looking at what challenges are presented and um, to what extent lessons have been learned from Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, we are also looking at the Army and Marine Corps training and uh, capacity and what lessons can be learned uh, as they look to migrate um, from Iraq to Afghanistan. So we will be reporting out on both of those issues in the near future. Does that hold true as well on medical attention to troops in the field? Somebody looking at the uh, the capacity that we have to improve that situation as well. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. All right. So uh, let me just a couple wrap-up questions here. We we obviously have a concern about the heavy reliance on contractors in a lot of different fields. I know you're all looking at that, but so isn't the wartime uh, contracting commission on that. Do, do all of you feel comfortable in your relationship with the wartime contracting commission, and have uh, they been uh, sort of included in some of your deliberations? You're all nodding yes, so I, I take it that they have. Uh, and nobody sees a conflict or uh, an impediment anywhere there. Ms. Williams Bridges, let me ask this of you. Uh, I see GAO as a little bit of a different organization than I see the Inspectors General. Uh, you're traditionally known as Congress's investigatory arm, uh, and I, I think it's great that you're working in concert with them on a lot of different projects. Are you also maintaining enough independence uh, to be able to stand aside and report something when? Uh, somebody else may not have uh, gotten to it yet or may not have done it in a way that uh, or with the depth that we think it should have been done because they have capacity issues and training issues or whatever. Uh, yes. I, I believe yes to all of your questions. Uh, you will notice in the um, quarterly reports of SIGUR and our joint subgroup report that GAO in very limited instances has identified planned work. While we have informal discussions with our colleagues in the IG offices about work that we have planned. Because all of our work in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan is undertaken under CGA, CGA authority, Comptroller General's authority, um, we do so because we are uh, addressing the interests and the needs of, of the myriad committees who have jurisdiction over the issues of U.S. engagement involved uh, and surrounding U.S. engagement in these countries. And so we respond not only to your interests, we respond to the congressional mandates as well as areas in need of follow-up. So we maintain some flexibility in planning out our work to be most responsive and timely in responding to your needs. So we assure our independence in that way from um, the others who have similar missions but different uh, clients. Now, I'm not asking you to answer the subject matter of my next question, but to give me an opinion as to whether or not you can answer it and will be able to work with us. Will you or your office be able to give an opinion as to the best way for us to affect oversight in Pakistan uh, with respect to whether or not the Special Inspector uh, General's Office of Afghanistan ought to be extended to cover that area or whether some other approach might be advisable? Uh, we can provide you some insights based on uh, congressional uh, history right. and enacting legislation, standing up IGs. Yeah. Well, I think we may ask you to do that, and we may get together a more informal basis on that for an opinion, because I think we do want to look at uh, Ambassador Holbrook, uh, his comments that he made here, and in, in, uh, General Fields' comments as well. We welcome that. Thank you. Thank you on that. Any more questions? Do you folks have anything else? Mr. Murphy. Yeah, Mr. Murphy, no, I don't even see who there. <laughs> Mr. Murphy stealthily came into the room, so maybe we can look for him for some of our stealth uh, uh, technology on that basis. There's no questions. 
In that case, uh, is there anything that anybody wants to comment on that you thought might have been, been left unsaid? I'll start from my left over here, General Field. Thank you for allowing the, the opportunity, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I wish to go back maybe in about an hour uh, to that which uh, addressed the uh, white paper uh, produced by uh, Ambassador Akinberry, which uh, addresses how he would wish to approach Chef Matters Matters concerning I think is the, the, the reconstruction okay. effort. I want to point out uh, to this subcommittee that uh, during the course of the past uh, year, uh, making my first uh, trip to Afghanistan in this capacity last September, I've now visited uh, 13 uh, provinces and about as many PRTs or provincial reconstruction teams. I've met with about as many uh, governors of provinces or deputy governors of provinces. I've met with uh, practically all of the senior ministers of the government of Afghanistan to include three visits with President Karzai himself. Each time we visit, not just I, but I and my staff visit, we get this, uh, it, we receive this issue of Afghanistan w wanting to be more involved in the reconstruction of their country. So I say this because I uh, applaud, really, what Ambassador Eikenberry has put forth as um, what he would like to see as the way ahead in being more inclusive of the people of Afghanistan. Uh, this matter is resident in no less two documents that I am mandated in my legislation to oversee, the Afghanistan Compact and the Afghanistan National Development Strategy. This is a bold move. Yes, oversight uh, will be even more important. One thing we are doing as a part of CIGAR is to determine the extent to which those controls are in place, those management systems necessary to ensure the American taxpayer that his uh, and her money will be spent wisely and for the purposes made available by this very Congress. So we are on top of that, sir, and we will provide those, that feedback accordingly. Well, we're going to need it because I think Ms. Williams Rogers pointed out very clearly that if you go down that path and you want to pass your money through that government to enhance its legitimacy, then we had darn well better be sure that we have some safeguards in place how it's being spent. Given the current state of Mr. Karzai's government and the individuals that he has invited in to participate in that and the reputation for corruption uh, on that, I think we should be more than a little bit wary uh, about just forking the money over and hoping for the best. Uh, that we're going to need the advice and counsel of all of you to give us a very firm commitment on that, that, uh, that if we're going to try and buttress that government, even some of the provincial and more uh, district governments on that. We know who we're dealing with. We have in place the safeguards on that, and we have a strict monitoring day by day so that we can pull the plug on it any time we need to when it's, if it starts to go south on us, uh, or else I think we're all going to be the fool for it. We're going to have spent a lot of money that this country needs trying to do a national security issue that we also need, but it may be being wasted. So I think that's a critical uh, aspect of your functions on that, and I appreciate it, but I think that is right up there. Uh, with some of the priorities, if, they, if they, in fact the Ambassador Eikenberry's theory is going to be uh, borne out, uh, then that just raises the ante on all of us, I think. Absolutely, sir. That. Thank you. And at least a one last question that I didn't, almost forgot that I had, the SERP funds all right, uh, uh, that we have on that, the, the Commander's Emergency uh, Respond uh, Fund on that, the programs. Uh, that's about a billion six, you know, since 2004. Uh, on that. Uh, are we monitoring that and uh, updating our monitoring of how that's being spent and what results we're getting from it? I, I know that previous reports have not really seen a, a real tight accounting on that. I, I think my colleague Mr. wishes Hedell, to um, sure. say something about it, sir, but m let me uh, go ahead and say, since the green light is on for me right at the moment, uh, we have just completed uh, a, uh, an audit of, uh, of SERP, and um, we have found um, certain strengths and, of course, as one might expect, certain weaknesses uh, in the oversight uh, of that spending. Uh, we will um, report out on this by the close of business today or within the next uh, 24 hours. Uh, there are some issues to which uh, we are advising U uh, U.S. Forces Afghanistan to uh, turn uh, their attention, and we are confident that they will, sir. Well, we would appreciate a copy of that report as soon as it's done, and you can accommodate us on that. Second, sir. We would appreciate a copy of that report as soon Absolutely. as you publish it on that. Absolutely, sir. That, okay. It and should and be posted on our website uh, within the next 24 hours. Is that correct, Monica? Thank you. 
Thank you. I would ask the unanimous consent that the record be held open until that report is filed and then be included in the committee's uh, report. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yes, the GAO has right. also recently completed a report on SERP uh, where we found that there was a need for additional oversight, there was a need for additional trained personnel. While the uh, intended effects of the provision of um, funding for certain projects uh, was very good, um, we do believe that there is need for better coordination between DOD and USAID uh, to make sure that that money is well spent. And who do you recommend do that additional oversight on it? DOD and USAID, DOD specifically. Gentlemen, are we up to it? Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, we've, this is a very important area uh, in terms of our considerations. We did do work and we're going to, we got more work planned, but our most recent um, report, I think, goes back to 07. And we found administrative weaknesses. We had concerns. In fact, 15 of 16 pay agents uh, did not have adequate storage uh, for cash and other assets. Um, Two pay agents made uh, inappropriate uh, payments. So we, we've, we have found some what we would consider to be serious concerns with that, and we're continuing to watch it. The department knows we're very, very uh, on top of that, and we will have additional work to be done in the future. Okay. Well, we're going to take a look at the Inspector General's report and the uh, Government Accountability reports in your most recent reports, even though they're a little bit dated on that or whatever, and, and determine whether or not we think there's a need for another hearing or whether or not we'll just keep monitoring what it is you're doing on that. But I, I do agree with you, sir, that this is very, very important. Um, do you have anything you want to say, Mr. Cantatisa? Because you're going to be asked to, to do some more oversight in this area. You have the capacity to do it? Uh, yes, I believe okay. we do. Uh, but you have the I, willingness I, to do it? I'm sorry? You have the willingness to do it? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, but I'd like to comment, though, on uh, the question you posed to General Fields about extending his authority into Pakistan. Certainly. Um, uh, this is not a reflection. My opinion is not a reflection on the fine work that General uh, Fields and his staff does. But, but I think in a general sense that um, the statutory IGs that here present and others that, that work in, that will or do work in Pakistan have the ability and the expertise to provide the oversight if given the resources and the funding to do so. Uh, whether, you know, the Congress wants to establish another inspector general uh, a special inspector general in that area is certainly, you know, a, a political decision to be made. But, but, but I, for one, think that, that we as a group can actually provide the oversight that's, uh, that's necessary. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for your testimony here today, for your expertise. It's a tremendous help uh, for us as we're trying to perform our job on, on what gets to be a complex and growing uh, universe of, of events on that. So have our appreciation. Uh, we continue to work with you and look forward to doing that. And wish you all a good day for the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. The U.S. House is not in session today. Next week, Democratic leaders say members will consider a new Energy Department program.